Good morning. We have a couple of announcements we want to go over as we get started. First off, uh, here this afternoon, we do not have an afternoon meal or service. Uh, the nursing home service is at 2 o'clock, uh, but we'll just plan on my kind of, kind of doing that. Uh, obviously, we're not going to stop anybody from joining us, but uh, I know that uh, this is a kind of a busy weekend for many of us. Uh, so that'll be 2 o'clock this afternoon, just up the road at the nursing home. And uh, then we encourage you to come back tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. Uh, for our Christmas Eve service, pretty much the same as we have done in the past. We'll read through uh, numerous accounts, Old and New Testament, in regards to Christmas, and uh, sing the Christmas carols that kind of coordinate with those readings. And uh, then we'll conclude with a lights out and uh, candlelight aspect of the service. And uh, we encourage you to be here for that. There's no, I think six o'clock is early enough that I can say this because I don't imagine that. Any of us will be in our pajamas yet, but it's a come as you as you are. Okay. Um, okay. So, <laughs> I know some churches have like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and you can't say that. <laughs> That's right, the qualification. Um, but seriously, I know that there's all many times Christmas Eve, you're with family, and you're right in the middle of something, we encourage you to come. And uh, if you're in blue jeans, that's fine. If, if, you're, if you want to get coat and tie, that's fine as well. Uh, but we just encourage you to be here. And it won't be long, usually. <laughs> 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 yeah, try to, try to keep it so it's not embarrassing for the rest of us. Um, but that'll be tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. And uh, usually probably about 40, 45 minutes or so. And this time to quiet our hearts, reflect our hearts uh, towards uh, the actual what took place for Christmas. And uh, then we'll dismiss it, go to the way. We may have some refreshments as well in the back. Just very minor, something to grab on your way out. And uh, before you go eat more food, undoubtedly, <laughs> grab something and uh, get the taste of what's flowing, kind of like your appetizer. But anyway, that'll be uh, tomorrow night. And then uh, instead of having Wednesday, we'll have that tomorrow night. So no Wednesday, no midweek service this week. Uh, next Sunday, uh, Lord willing, we'd like to have an afternoon meal. I don't know if we have a, no, so I guess whatever you'd like to bring, bring for next week, the meal, and uh, then as well, we'll have an afternoon service, uh, working on uh, trying to come up with something that we can do that's kind of an end of the year, uh, I don't want to say fun, because I don't want to uh, indicate that the rest of the things that we do are not fun, uh, but something uh, maybe a little lighter uh, here to finish out the year, and I encourage you to be a part of that next Sunday. And then we'll continue on with our normal for January and February, as we've done in uh, oh boy, the last 10, 15 years, is uh, afternoon meals and services every Sunday during the winter, during the hard part of winter. We used to just do it for January, and uh, I don't know how many years we did this, we would have afternoon meals and services in January, and then we come to February, and we had half the services canceled because of the weather, and we realized, you know, we really should include this in February as well. And uh, so January, February, afternoon meals, afternoon services, I would hope by next week we'll have maybe a, a schedule of, of meal, what do you call that, menu items, and uh, we'll go from there. Other than that, am I missing anything? I think everything on the screen there. So today, just this morning service, tomorrow night, candlelight service, 6 o'clock, no Wednesday night, and then we'll back to our regular schedule next week on Sunday. Caitlin, doing an uh, maybe if we had Mr. Miller come take the morning offering, and I think that'd be it. Maybe not for you guys. So. Okay. Thank you. Lord, we thank you again for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you and gather our hearts. And even as the opportunity they have, this uh, gift presented to us here this morning, I pray again that you challenge us. And even as we give, I pray that we give with cheerful hearts unto you. As we sing, that we would sing uh, with hearts of worship before you. We thank you for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.
start our first hymn here this morning. We'll hymn number 104. Let's stand as you sing Joy to the World 104. <laughs> Yes, I do 
Vincent Espino, but very blessed. Pregnancy Center, um, AJ, in the boot camp, and we did get a letter. Got a letter that he uh, I mentioned last week, he was in the infirmary. This is not two weeks ago. He was in the infirmary at the beginning of uh, the swim portion of boot camp. And uh, as pretty much all the guys had a nasty chest, coughing up all kinds of nasty. Uh, it doesn't sound pleasant at all. Just stay there, AJ. That's good for you and <laughs> good for us not to have. Uh, but anyway, uh, his turn in the pink eye. So he got put in, turned into the or put in an infirmary, kind of a, a sick bay type of a thing. And uh, he only had so many days to get the swim session passed. And uh, he wound up on the last day was released and got a pass. That was a, his one we thought would be a weakness. And he passed it in one try. A lot of the guys in the platoon that were attempted on Monday and Tuesday were still having to retake on the same day that he took it the first time. And uh, so that made AJ a little concerned. If these guys can't pass it, I'm not a really good swimmer, so how is this all going to work out? Uh, but as is common in boot camp, as the Satan was in the letter, I realized that all you have to do is listen to what they say and do it, and it all works out well. Uh, so anyway, he's still with his platoon. He's thus far still with his platoon. Uh, as of uh, this coming Friday, uh, they get shipped over to Camp Pendleton uh, from the recruit depot. It's really just kind of outside of uh, San Diego, Camp Pendleton. And then he's there for four weeks, including the fourth week with the Crucible, uh, which we'll be saying more of as we get closer. But that's certainly a time to keep uh, him in your prayers. Uh, the uh, Eric, Eric, Eric Camp works for the uh, funeral, okay. funeral wilding and things like his son went to the crucible. Not, I'm not saying this so that you all have to do this, but just saying this because to show you the importance of it. Uh, their church, and I'm not sure which one they is, I think one of the bigger ones in Peoria. They actually did, I think, was it 72 hours? I think the crucible last 72 hours. 72 hours on about four hours of sleep. And if their, their bodies and their minds are just put to the ultimate test. And if they pass it, they get their little symbol, their marine. If they don't, well, they have to do it again. And, uh, so anyway, uh, hit their church there, at Cam's church, for his son when he went through this, did a round-the-clock prayer service for 72 hours. And so just different people in the church signed up for certain hours, and they just prayed consistently for him. Uh, so he was being prayed for the entire 72 hours of that. Uh, that would be difficult, difficult for us because there's not too many of us to do that. Uh, but certainly want to keep uh, AJ in your prayers. That's uh, here at the end of this week, Friday. Uh, he heads over to... Uh, Hamilton and begins the process of preparing for that wonderful journey. Matt is here today, and I think he's got $200 left for his mission trip that they're taking in the uh, end of January, and let's continue to pray for that. So I think that is answered. Yes, the next one is answered. Uh, Aaron has answered all, is doing well there. Certainly, as already was mentioned, that's family, best family. Uh, Ryan, I think, is pretty much answered as well for point, doing better, still concerned. Uh, this is Mary's nephew. He has some shoulder problems and not able to scan a salute. And pretty important in the military. Just a couple of years left for retirement, and uh, he does not want to get discharged. And uh, miss out on all the extras. Mr. Miller is here today. It's a great answer to the prayer as well. And he continued to pray for Mrs. Zier. I want to say as well. <coughs> Unless there are any others, let's go to the Lord in prayer. The Lord, we thank you again just for all that you are doing. We thank you for the praise that we can rejoice in, how you've worked, how you've answered. And uh, we certainly do pray that you would be with uh, the very ones there on that list. So we pray for AJ and uh, this is the continued road ahead for him and uh, for the many others in his platoon there. I just pray that you would uh, give strength and grace and even health uh, when, when it seems like everybody has been sick this entire time. I just pray that you give all of them uh, just the endurance and even now, uh, perhaps here in a few hours, perhaps time change as they begin services. I just pray that again, as many of these guys that perhaps have never gone to church before in their lives are attending services just for a break uh, from the, uh, the from the yelling. And I just pray that you would uh, just allow a message to be clear here today there in San Diego, that they'd be able to understand in their quietness uh, who you are. And so you pray for Matt and the needs there as reaching uh, his goal for his mission trip, I pray that you continue to provide there as, as necessary. Certainly you pray for Mrs. Ear and her needs, and uh, certainly with the adjustments and, and medications and just trying to figure out what all is taking place, and 
that seems to be a progress. And we thank you for that. I just pray that you continue on with that road as well. Certainly do pray for the stem bridges and both of their families that are involved here. I certainly just ask that in all these details of wrapping up estates and making these decisions and, and all that's involved, I just pray that you would give grace, that you would give direction, that there would certainly be unity uh, through this process. And uh, I just pray that you would do ultimately what only you can do. And we thank you for that. We certainly do pray for Addis. He turns back to work and certainly all that has been waiting for him. I just pray that you give him the strength, the health, Oh boy, and the patience uh, certainly in adjusting all of this, and uh, I just ask that you would be honored to that as well. We certainly do ask that you continue to be with Chad and Samantha, and just their marriage, their hearts. I pray you be with Samantha, you specifically, and just the needs there as well. And for the two kids that are involved, I just ask that you do a great, great thing. And while at times it's hard for us to imagine what you are doing, I just pray that we all involved will be able to have I just complete understanding that, that you are at work and that you can do a great and mighty things beyond our expectations. For any others on those lists that I'm, that's what we're looking at, just pray that you continue to direct, continue to provide, and in our own hearts and lives and the requests that we haven't mentioned publicly, that you do the same as well. We thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's sing one more hymn here, 118, What Child Is This?
anyone have ever already paid off one of these yet? I don't know. I mean, it's still a lot of boxes to unpack. Oh, come on. No one asked me. What's the activity anyway? Well, we're going to go there. I'm going to go to my parents' house. Oh, all the way. So only if I get two cookies. Yeah, it'll be fun.
so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross just to save us. Jessica, we really thought of it that way. Well, then don't you go to church? Well, my mom goes to church, but I don't see how going to church would help me. It just wastes my time when I can bring home enough for, for I don't know. But church does help us in lots of ways. Yeah, we can be encouraged by other believers. And, and we can bring with our God, and we can pray together. How would that not be? I don't know. Very good. When you're all done, you can put them on the tray so we can bake them. Can I have a bracelet back there? Oh, sure. Where did it go? Did you lose it? No, I put it right here. Did you take it? No. Well, it could have just walked away. Where did you put it? I told you I put it right here. Calm down, girl. I'm sure it's here somewhere. Here it is. You broke it? It must have gotten snagged somehow. How could you? Hey! This is the only thing I had left behind of my dad before he died. And you broke it? I'm sorry. Faith, calm down. It can be fixed. Fix it? You can't fix this. My mom fixes this stuff all the time. I bet she could. No! No one can fix this. Not even you. I'm sorry.
grandmother gave me a necklace. I love that necklace. I wore that necklace everywhere. I never took it off. When you were about two, you wanted to play with the necklace. I found you later with the chain broken and the pennant covered with glitter glue. You wanted to make a princess necklace out of it. I remember that. I'm sorry. You were only two. You didn't, it was an accident. You didn't mean to do it. Just like today with Taylor. It was an accident. She didn't mean to make the bracelet. You need to forgive her. Just like I forgave you all those years ago. One way of showing God's love is forgiveness. Okay, I will. And then give me a cookie. <laughs> Thank you for oh. Hey, ladies, I'm sorry for what I've been talking about. Me too. Oh, happy that that happened. I know that there's been a lot to do. It's so okay, good. fine. And I forgive you. You do? Why? Because God created me. What better way to show God's love than to forgive my enemies? Now, do you forgive me? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. For what? For inviting me today. I think I'll come to your crazy activities more often. Do you want to be in my Christmas program? I would love to. Now let's go. Where? It's cookie time. Places, think of Christmas programs, church. Um, one of our favorites is uh, eggnog shakes my wife makes for us at home. Well, eggnog and some ice cream and blend it all together, and uh, it's fantastic. Um, so many routines that we do. Christmas carol, just a couple of weeks ago that we went and did, even in the program, Christmas carol in there as well. But we can remove all of the events, we can remove all of the activities and uh, even here in the next couple of days, I'm, I'm guessing we'll be together with family, uh, spending time around the Christmas tree, opening presents, probably eating, probably more than we should. Um, if we can remove all of that, what do we have left? Uh, we have a, uh, the very reality of, of the, the nature of Christmas, Christ in a manger. Uh, we have the reality of, of shepherds. We have the reality of Mary and Joseph. Mary pondering all these things in their hearts. We have the reality of a, a babe, but we know that the, the gospel message is not contained in the birth of Christ, but the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Yet we know that the birth of Christ is required for him to come to die. And uh, ultimately, I think if we can peel away all the layers, and we can get to the, uh, so what is our takeaway? What is it that we can go home with? 
as the message of Christmas. Certainly there's a message of love for God so loved the world. But there's also in that in that mixture of love the very reality of what they presented here this morning. The reality of forgiveness. For while we were yet sinners, Christ came to die for us. And uh, when you think a lot of that very reality of, of forgiveness, I, I didn't put anything on the screen other than our voice. Uh, but if you, if you look at the, uh, uh, very quickly, and you may not even have to turn there, but if you look very quickly even at the uh, uh, the narrative of all the, the lineages uh, and see what happened and how it happened, and you, and you see what took place in regards to who was listed there. Uh, boy, you come with a list of, well, you come with a list of people just like us. And yet Christ came to be a part of us, for us. He died for us. Several verses I want to read just in leading up to this. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, it says, But while he thought on these things, here's Joseph. You can take along the lines in the human terms. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Luke chapter 1, verse 43, upon Mary meeting up with Elizabeth, and John jumps in her womb. I believe it was my brother John that thought that was Mary jumped, or uh, John jumped in his womb. I guess that makes sense as well. So says, and what is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Luke chapter 2, verse 11, the announcement to the shepherd that says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 2, verse 29 and 30 through 32, Simeon holds Christ in his arms at the temple. And he says this, My eyes have seen thy, in reference to God, my eyes have seen thy salvation. Christ, in his own words, many years later, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, would say this, For the Son of Man is to come to seek and save that which was lost. But to reach that point of Christ accomplishing that which he came forth to do, and the very reality of all these verses I just read, but to Joseph, to Mary, to Elizabeth, now to Christ's own words, and uh, certainly as well in Simeon's own words, uh, the acknowledgement that Christ was coming as a Savior, that he's coming as a Redeemer, he's coming as one who is coming to pay a price. What an ultimate sacrifice that was in the area of forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says this, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, or even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, I know this is part of the, the skit, and it was a theme of their skit, and uh, clearly the theme of the Christmas program of the skit, the program in the program almost, uh, was on the theme of forgiveness. But uh, I think a great takeaway for us is the very reality of the forgiveness of God for us and even coming to this earth for us. I have, I mentioned already, but I have a kind of an overview of some of these people I've written down here. Matthew chapter, this is Matthew's lineage. Matthew chapter 1, verse 2. It mentions uh, uh, Jacob. I was going to start with Abraham. But here we have Jacob then as well. Probably don't need to get any farther than Jacob and ask this question. Do we have a could there be a possibility of some sibling issues taking place here? Some some rivalry that takes place. Uh, uh, Judas <laughs> as the father, so the son. In verse three, we have Tamar, uh, who was in idolatry, uh, harlotry, I should say, or at least the intention or appearance of such. Verse six, we have David. Certainly, he was defined as a friend of God, but certainly he had issues. He had certainly sin uh, in his life. Solomon said to be the wisest man. Also listed in verse 6, certainly can't be disputed in that regard, but um, but he certainly had a lot to learn. <laughs> a lot of things that we have recorded that he pursued in the attempts of finding answers, finding a reason under the sun, and everything that he pursued seemed to be leading him back to the very reality that that was not it, until he discovered God. Verse 7, the name's Rehoboam, the boy of the divided kingdom comes to mind, losing 10 of the 12 tribes under his leadership. Abijah, if I'm saying that right, seemed to even be worse than his father. Things start begin to roll quickly downhill. Verse 8, named Lame Jehoshaphat, who had a very unhealthy alliance with Ahab. Uh, Jerome, or uh, Jerome after him, 
actually married the daughter of Ahab and walked in all of Ahab's ways. And Uzziah, seems as if a few generations are missing here, which I think is very interesting. Um, Uzziah would have been Joram's great-great-grandson, but all of those that are missing there in the, in the realm of probably need to keep everything synchronized, 14, 14, 14 generations, as it's listed a little later. Um, we just have wickedness on wickedness on wickedness. Verse 9 mentions Ahaz. Uh, he has a reputation of being Judah's worst king, right there in the lineage of Christ. Hezekiah, on the other hand, was much like his father, David. And Manasseh started out as an evil king, but he understood the very reality of repentance. And Ammon, again, back to the reality of evil. Josiah, finally, a good king, uh, a young king. And it did that which was right in the eyes of God. Matthew chapter 1, verse 12 mentions Zerubbabel. And uh, he is a man credited with rebuilding the temple during Ezra's day. But certainly at that point, if I were God, I'd be saying, really, I'm sending my son in this lineage? And, and this whole mass of people that can't do anything right? And this mess of people, certainly there's some good ones in there, certainly. Uh, but... The Son of God, <laughs> be born in the lineage of, of these, some of these men uh, that are mentioned here. Again, a very picture and uh, example of, of ultimate forgiveness. Then we come to verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1 in regards to what a great scandal. In regards to Joseph and Mary. I should turn here so I can read it here. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. In regards to uh, Joseph. Let me read this. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm sure we all know this, just as a quick review, obviously in, in Judaism, they had a betrothal period. And they actually went through a ceremony. Uh, they gave vows, they committed to each other, and then they had this time where bride would go back home with her parents, uh, groom would go home with his parents, and on many times would build an addition on gas home for his bride. And it would be anywhere from a couple of months to about a year would be the time frame of this betrothal period. But in legal terms, they were married. In uh, actual physical terms, they had not yet consummated the marriage. But, but by definition, they were married. And it was during this time that if the woman was found to be with child, as Mary was, it, it really is ultimately that exception clause of divorce that we have written elsewhere. Uh, that by legal definition, they were married, but yet they had not consummated, and she had been found ultimately unfaithful. She's a child. And it says in the very next verse, verse 19, that Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. His love, even an, to an aspect of his forgiveness to her, and ultimately he's, he's trying to figure out how he can do this privately. He's trying to do how to do this right while maintaining a, a reputation of being a just man. Very next verse of the law he thought on these things. He's not rash. He's not jumping to quick conclusions. He's not re responding and reacting as, as human nature often does. He's pondering these things. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And it says, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Fear not. No, I wouldn't say fear not if there wasn't an aspect of great fear for him to take her then almost implicates him to a point, but it also accepts her to a complete point for who she is and where she is and the very reality of her carrying a child that was not his. But the angel says, don't fear. I know there's tremendous fear here. Uh, there's a lot of confusion here, but fear not to take it unto thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled with the spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Verse 24, then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. See, even in the Christmas, that, that very reality of the Christmas story is... <laughs> uh, Forgiveness just oozes from it. Obedience certainly oozes from it. Faith certainly oozes from it. But I, I, I marvel at the very reality of verse 24 when Joseph wakes up 
and in civil obedience just says, all right, I'm going to do as I've been told. It doesn't make sense. Certainly, his very nature was one of fear in this scenario, because he told to fear not. All that was in him was saying, this doesn't make sense. All that was with them saying, nah, I don't like this. Something, something isn't right here. But yet, what a picture that we have, even in Joseph, being a just man, doing exactly as he was, he was commanded, as he was told to do. So let me just ask a couple of questions. Just in closing. Why did the Messiah come from the lineage of David? Well, sort of if you go back to the Old Testament and elaborate that, I could unpack the entire series. That the way I do things probably would take all 2019 to go over. But when we look at again this lineage, why would God allow his own son to come to be a descendant of them? When we look at the very question of Joseph and why would Joseph move forward in taking this obviously with child mother who was his wife, and yet it was not his baby? Why would he do such a thing, or how could he do such a thing? And he quite literally, the magnificent picture of forgiveness could be presented as our takeaway for Christmas here. How self righteous, or even still, I say, how hypocritical it is for us. That at times we demand that Christ be kept in Christmas. Maybe even at times, I hope not us, but many times there are those who get very offended if someone says happy holidays to us. How dare you? Merry Christmas. And we often will make a point that even if someone says happy holidays, we'll respond with Merry Christmas. And sometimes they're like, oh yeah, Merry, Merry Christmas. And other times you can see there's a little offense on their part that we actually said the, the naughty words of Merry Christmas as if that's a bad thing to say. And I know over the decades in the past that there have been even boycotts of those businesses that haven't said Merry Christmas or Christmas sale in their advertising as opposed to this holiday. You know, it's very hypocritical for us as we demand those things of the lost world, but we refuse to see the very reality of forgiveness ourselves. How dare you say happy holidays when we all know this is Christmas? <laughs> How dare you stand there and give us a flyer that says holiday sale instead of Christmas sale? And why is it that we have to call it a holiday tree instead of a Christmas tree? And we can get all bent out of shape and all frustrated and many times, sadly enough, even bitter about it. That How, how, how does this happen? It's a Christmas. But at the same while, we remove all the layers of what we put as Christmas and the the stockings and the presents and the trees and the lights and and uh, uh, the eggnog <laughs> and all those other things that we do. And we realize that all we have left is Luke chapter 2, Matthew chapter 1. We have the birth of a child. We have the birth of Emmanuel, God with us, showing to us not only love but tremendous forgiveness. How hypocritical it is of us to say, Thou must say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays. But I don't have to forgive. What a challenge I think that is of us. And I appreciate it. That's the first time I saw uh, the program. I didn't get to see any of the practicing. And uh, what a, uh, in a very quick way, what a, a challenge it is for us to live out in a very long way. Uh, it will take the rest of our lives really to put into practice what they just presented to us in a few minutes. Uh, to live out forgiveness. To live out the reality that while we were yet sinners, Christ came to die for us. The ultimate picture of forgiveness. And I know that Christmas comes with a lot of baggage at times, and this afternoon when you're looking at the problem of Christmas at the nursing home, um, and I know there's a lot of baggage at times that comes at Christmas time. There's a lot of bitterness that is kind of uh, opened back up every Christmas season. And there's a lot of people that really struggle uh, with Christmas. And I understand, I understand those details, I understand some of the, the life that they have behind them. But can I remind us that one of the, one of the truths at the, at the foundational level of the Christmas story is the reality of learning how to forgive. To forgive as we have been forgiven. I don't know what the program title is called, uh, The Forgiveness of Christmas. I'll, I'll call it that. Caitlin wrote it, but I'll, I'll title it. The forgiveness of Christmas. And uh, uh, 
may we learn the forgiveness of Christmas. And uh, it may be something as, as simple in that regard as a, a bracelet that was broken by someone maybe not as careful as they should have been. Or it may be something much larger, much more colossal in our opinions anyway. But may we learn the very reality of Christ coming as a baby, not only in the lineage of sinners, but also even in the home of a man who did that which was right, even though everything within his heart said, whoa, not me. The very reality of forgiveness. May we learn. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for you. We thank you for what was accomplished for us. How that all began in a manger. How that ultimately all began here as the narrative is played out with a, a man named Joseph as he does that which is right. Does that which he's told. And uh, takes on him his wife. Even though everything in tradition, everything in the custom, everything in his own heart was saying not so. Uh, we thank you that uh, he did. And I do pray that we will be able to live out that same reality. So the, the very understanding that we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. And one of the underlying foundational point we have of Christmas in regards to forgiveness. I pray that there, if there's bitterness, if there's just frustrations, if there's uh, whatever might be in our hearts as we face this next Christmas season. I pray that we would learn as we stare at that manger with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords what it truly means to forgive. And we thank you for what you'll do in our hearts and lives thereafter. In Jesus' name, amen. One more song, I believe, that we'd like to sing here. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Let's say as we sing was 860. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's, for some people, it's very easy for us to forgive. Others, unfortunately, become more trying for us. We learn how to forgive, but we may also have a day in Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. Father, you've done for us. We thank you for what you're doing through us. And I pray that we be able to live out your forgiveness, that we be able to live out your love, be able to live out the very reality of all that was presented to us that first Christmas morning. And I pray that we wouldn't just throw in all of our routines, all of our activities, and uh, neglect the message, the challenge, the love, the presence, Emmanuel. And I pray that you go with us as we go our separate ways. Use us, stretch us, and even as we spend time with our families, that you would use us there as well. And we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.